the Spectrum Techniques Isotope Generator. Basically, a barium 137M radionuclide generator. Let's test it and see how it works. All right, so let's see what you get here. This is the plastic container that holds the material, holds the device. It says Spectrum Techniques Isotope Generator. Could, you could also call it a radionuclide generator. Um, Cesium-137 to barium-137M, that's, that's what it does. It's made in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Not by, no, not by Oak Ridge National Laboratories, mind you, by Spectrum Techniques, but still, Oak Ridge is like the radioactive hub. <laughs> radioactive material, of course. This is an exempt quantity, which means that the United States Nuclear Regulatory Commission says that the amount of activity, a number of decays per second, in this particular device is so low as to not cause any particular health hazard. In fact, it, it is a browning error as far as radiation is concerned. I'll show you in just a minute what I mean on that. So let's open it up. And the reason I'm wearing a glove, after just saying what I just said, is because this contains a device that's been used. This is mine. I've actually used it before. So that means I passed the liquid solution through it before, and I have a golden rule. Whenever dealing with something that passes uh, liquid and radiation together, like radioactive material and liquid, one should always wear a glove. It's just a smart thing to do. Um, if this had never been used, I wouldn't worry about a glove because it's contained inside of its little source and it's not coming out. It comes with this nifty little pamphlet, which you can open up, see it has nice little pictures and everything. It's a nice little well-made pamphlet, too. I mean, I don't, don't think you would get this for the pamphlet, but it's still nice, though. See, it has a little decay scheme. Actually, everything you'd probably need to figure out most things are in here. It explains what comes in the, in the package uh, and how to use it and some warnings. They're very simple warnings. They pretty much tell you, you know, don't put the liquid on yourself. No, you know, wear a glove, that sort of thing. Um, it's reasonably safe. You could use this in a uh, college physics class. Uh, I don't know if your school would let you, but you could probably use this in a high school physics class. Um, I don't see why that would cause a problem, although I wouldn't let the students handle it. I would have the teacher handle it and show the students how to use it. For the college one, I would say the students can use it because they're grown adults at this point, but with, of course, instruction first. Anyway, let me pull out one of these. This is a little planchet thing. It's a little metal thing that you put the droplets of the liquid that contains the barium 137M in, and then you can take this and put it somewhere to test or do whatever you want to do with it. This is a small plastic syringe that you use to squeeze the uh, solution through the actual generator to produce the radioactive output. And this is the actual generator itself. This is a barium 137M generator. It tells you the direction to point. It's kind of like if you ever seen one of those little bazooka things they always show in the movies, they say point this way. It's kind of like that. Um, this contains 10 microcuries, which in SI units would be 370 kilobecquerels or 370,000 decays per, sec per second, if you like. And you're going to hook this onto the top of that and squeeze the fluid through. Now, what is the fluid? The fluid is this, an eluding solution. Because remember, this, the, the, the solution to elution is dilution? No, not really. But anyhow, this is the actual eluding solution. You can see it contains sodium chloride and uh, hydrogen chloride, a little tiny bit of it mixed, very, very tiny amount of it mixed with mostly, it looks like water. And you pour this through, and what happens is there's an ion exchange, and the barium 137M is a little bit looser than the cesium 137 and comes out um, in, in, in little droplets. Uh, I have significantly tested the resulting. Uh, uh, sodium and potassium crystals that are, sorry, not potassium, sorry, the sodium crystals that are left over behind from this, I cannot find evidence of cesium-137 residue in it. And I'm, I'm doing this with uh, crystal-based uh, gamma spectroscopy, so I, they may be there, but if they're there, they're undetectable to me. You can also get additional bottles of the eluding solution if you're like me and you do this way too much. So, there you go. Let's get a, a rough idea of how active the sample is. Let's put it up right here. Just turn it and put it right like this. Now, a neat thing that you can do, um, pull our glove off, so hand is now free of glove. Oh my god, it turns my hand pink. Is you can take a Geiger counter and set it to an activity measurement, like uh, in this case, microsieverts per hour or millirankins or whatever, and it's actually going to be accurate because this is not, this doesn't even have, um, uh, beta coming out of it. The beta is pretty much blocked by the plastic, and if you have the little cover in the front, you're pretty much blocking the majority of it. I'm just going to cut the volume up and let you see this. Let me prop this up for you to see. Propping up to see. There you go. And now we're at 0 0.38 microsieverts per hour. This is going to be reasonably accurate. 
We'll see what we get. All right, I paused it for a second to let that build up. I'm seeing between 27 and 30 microsieverts per hour. Not very high. And moving it back just the tiniest little bit, it drops drastically because of distance inverse square. Basically, the same amount of radiation as having to fill larger and larger spaces moves away from you, and so it drastically drops off. So as you can see, there's not actually a lot of radioactivity coming from this. This is gamma that we're detecting right now in some x-rays. Move it all the way back here by the camera, and we see our nifty little camera is getting exposed to maybe just a hair over background. Now, while Geiger counter is not the most efficient thing at detecting this, a scintillator is usually a little bit better. So let's take our Ludlum right here and um, move our eluding solution out of the way. Cut the volume on. We have this set to the times 1000 mode. This is a Ludlum 12. And so we have 0, 100, uh, 100 200,000, 300,000, 400,000, 500,000 counts per minute. So let's, um, let's take the actual sodium iodide uh, one inch crystal detector and, oops, bend the cable out of the way. Can't, the cables get twisted up sometimes in these Ludlums. If you've ever messed with a Ludlum, I'm sure you know, although they're still wonderful anyway. And put that right up against the detector and we get 200,000 counts per minute, 300 counts, thousand counts per minute. 320, 330, 340, 340,000 counts per minute. But as you can see, when you move the detector away, that drops down to almost nothing. Still pretty high, but this unit has a pretty high background to begin with. Thank you, Ludlum. All right, so let's take this unit now and prepare ourselves a sample to test. As you can see from this decay scheme that I made, cesium-137 is at the top, represented by the blue line at the very top, and at the very bottom you have barium-137M. Cesium-137, which is at the top, has a half-life of 30.1 years and decays via beta decay, beta minus specifically. Um, it decays to barium-137, which is completely stable, which is at the bottom. And it continuously does this. About half of your quantity of cesium-137 will have converted to barium-137 in a 30.1 year period. 30.1 years after that, the remaining amount you have will have decayed by half and so on. Now, 5.3% of the time, it decays directly from cesium-137 to barium-137, no questions asked. However, 94.7% of the time, it decays to an intermediary state, if you will. Um, it's not a stable state per se, but it hangs there for a few seconds, few minutes, and so it's called meta-stable. It's not quite stable, but not quite unstable. This is referred to by adding a little m to the end of the um, atomic weight. So uh, barium-137m is barium-137 meta-stable. It is an isomer of barium-137, meaning the two are basically the same thing. The only difference is that the barium-137m has a excited nucleus that needs to de-excite. And as you can see, 85.1% of the time, this occurs by the emission of a gamma ray. The gamma ray that is emitted always has the energy of 661.66 kilo electron volts. That's what uh, we constantly measure. We use that for calibration. It's an absolutely wonderful energy to keep memorized. 14.9% it goes straight to the uh, straight straight to the ground state. Barium 137M has a half-life of 2.551 minutes. Now what we do with the barium generator is we squeeze the eluding solution through uh, cesium-137, uh, typically in little pellets or other various forms, and what we get out is a liquid that mostly has the barium 137M in it. This will then decay with a half-life of 2.551 minutes to the ground state. This allows us to very carefully and very quickly examine decay equations without the need for either long-term uh, radioisotopes or dangerous amounts of nuclear materials. All right, let's start. I have my Geiger counter pointed right here in dose units. not really needed, but I just figured, you know, what the heck, and it's actually sitting beside me right now so I can see what my dose rate is as it work. Um, I have a metal container sitting here to do my experiment on. Um, I'm going to put on gloves first, like I told you. When dealing with liquid materials, always use gloves. Now, like I've said before, this material is going to go back to background radiation in just a short period of time. 
So all of the stuff that's becoming radioactive will become non-radioactive in a very, very short time. But regardless, right this moment it is going to be radioactive. So we're clean right now, we haven't touched anything. Put on your goggles. Um, these I use because not only do they make uh, uh, good safety goggles, but they're also good for laser physics experiments. And my lasers that I, do, I play with, as you well know, are very powerful and cut through things. So let me put these on. You don't want to know how dorky I look right now. Okay, now, step one, planch it. Get that. Step two, give it a, give it a little shake. I don't actually know if you need to shake it, I always just do. All right, not all chemicals should be shooken, by the way, too, because it can do terrible things sometimes, depending on, on the liquid and what you're doing. Step three, get the actual syringe. And we're gonna put the syringe inside of the uh, liquid and pull out just a little bit There, and let's see, what is that? Is that in milliliters? I pull out about 1.5 milliliters. You see, I've already gotten a little bit on my hand. Now, this is this, the solution right here, right here will not hurt you. I guess if you drank it, it would hurt you, but it's not gonna hurt you, physically speaking. But, that's why you wear gloves. Now, let me pause this for a second. Actually, I'll just move this planchet out of the way, get another one. I spilled a little bit of the solution on this. It's harder to do this when you're using a camera, by the way, if you notice I bump things around a little bit. There's a clean one. That one will be fine. It doesn't have any nuclear material on it. We uncap the top. We uncap the bottom. And now we take this and we see where the arrow is pointing us. We fit this into this, nice and firmly, very firm. And now, let me squeeze this in. Squeeze that drops. Gently squeeze the drops. Don't force it. All right. Put this over here. It will leak a little bit at first. Might even turn it upside down, let it leak a little. There we have the eluding solution. It's there, ready to go. So, I'll take off one of my gloves, inside out. And using this ungloved hand, I will now take the Geiger counter and I will oops, see just what kind of dose we get. By the way, a lot easier when you don't have a camera rolling at the same time. So as you can see, this is the real deal. And the dose rate in this stuff is much higher, if I do recall. Don't want to get any closer because I don't want to actually touch the actual unit to that because I could contaminate it. 71 microsieverts, 50. It's probably a little bit hotter than that, but that's just because it's not shielded in any way, shape, or form. You're just getting it perfectly right there. So let's take this over to the spectrometer and see what we get. All right, so here we are already at the spectrometer to do the uh, test. This is uh, These are gold bricks. They're not really gold. They're actually lead that's painted with Rust-Oleum. Had to keep the lead off you because lead's actually pretty hazardous to your health, unlike the external exposure from the radiation here. The little sealed source that I'm using for calibration isn't going to do much of anything to you. It's sealed, and that's really nice. Uh, there's a one-inch sodium iodide detector inside of here. Let me pull it out quickly. This is also from Spectrum Techniques, as are the uh, lead toroids. You see the toroidal shapes right here. These are from Spectrum Techniques as well. This is a 10-stage photomultiplier tube and sodium iodide detector. Basically, this thing detects gamma radiation, if you don't know what I've been talking about for the last couple of seconds. That detects gamma rays, and we're going to use this to measure the decay of the barium 137M, which I better hurry up because it's decaying right this second. Uh, this is a uh, inspector. Um, this is an inspector USB from SE International. Uh, this is also going to be used for the demonstrations. I want to show you how you can use a Geiger counter to do the exact same thing. I have it connected via USB to the computer here, and I built this little enclosure from some spare pieces from my full-size lead castle to um, demonstrate this. Even a little foam block right here. So let's get rid of this check source, and let's quickly uh, calibrate the uh, unit and let's start the actual decay analysis. And I'm going to put the actual sample, the little planchet sample, right on top of this. And I'm going to put something, actually something plastic underneath it too, just to make sure nothing touches anything. Well, let's perform the tests and see what we get. To start out, we'll use the auto calibration with the cesium-137 check source that will calibrate the spectrometer so we can get a good quick cesium-137 spectrum. This is time-lapsed. It takes eh, about a minute or so normally for this to happen. 
So we're performing a spectrum right here, as you can see. This is actually a barium-137M, not of cesium-137. And as you can see, this looks just like a normal cesium-137 spectrum, which sort of tells you that what you're seeing from the cesium-137 spectrum comes from the actual barium-137M. So let's stop this and name all the constituent parts of the spectrum quickly. This right here, around 32 kilo electron volts, are the X-rays that come from the barium itself. Electrons that are around the barium atoms fall into place. This next bit over here, at 75 to 85 kilo electron volts, is actually the lead fluorescence from uh, uh, gamma rays striking the lead. Right here is the backscatter peak. This would be photons that bounce and ricochet right off the actual detector and fly back, or off the lead and the sample and fly back at the detector. This is the uh, Compton edge, and between the two is the Compton plateau. And of course right here is the primary photo peak, the part we care about. Let's put this in linear mode. Maybe it's a little easier to see. We'll scale it up now here so we can see. This might make things a bit more pronounced. We'll highlight the primary photo peak. Oops, let's try that again. There we go. So it's a region of interest, an integral if you like. That is the uh, primary photo peak. We'll smooth it out and you can see that's the actual thing we care about the most. Now we'll highlight the backscatter peak even though it's not a, a photo peak. We'll highlight the, uh, uh, the uh, Compton edge, the lead fluorescence, and the x-rays. So there are all the components that you would expect to see in a CZ-137 decay. So let's uh, switch this now to multi-channel internal scaling. This will allow us to count time and counts. We'll set the uh, each channel to be about uh, two seconds worth of time. So the, the channels will move across dwelling for two seconds at a time and will count up as you can see here for the number of counts that filled each one of those two second channels. We'll change the uh, pixel size to be a little bigger. Maybe that'll be easier for you folks to see. And let's uh, start calculating. The scintillator worked pretty well, so let's let the Geiger counter have a go at it. This is a Geiger graph from Mineral Labs. Uh, it's used for RadiationNetwork.com. The red line is the actual decay curve itself. You can see the decay curve very easily. Um, the yellow and green lines you'll see are statistical uh, numbers if you were actually doing background monitoring, which is what the software is really for. But it can do decay curve analysis quite, quite effectively, as you can see. All right. Okay, so we've come back to the uh, sample here. It's been many minutes since we did the actual test. And what's going back down to background, um, I'm still not going to touch it with my ungloved hands because in, technically speaking, there could in theory be some small traces of Hesium-137 in this. I've never detected any, but you never know. Um, well, let's just see what we get. We take the inspector, let's open up the back so the entire uh, window is exposed. Let's see what we get. I don't want to touch it. There's perhaps a tiny trace of radioactivity left in it, but almost none. You can see with the uh, Ludlum, this is in the times 10 mode, so you're looking at 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 counts per minute. We're, um, let's switch this to the turtle for slow. We're looking at uh, 2,800 counts per minute. We put this right up over top of it. We're not really going up. So we're pretty much back down to background. So do you like the isotope generator? Click the links below if you want to actually see how to do all the math and equations to go along with this. And uh, thank you for watching my videos at uh, anti-proton.com. And of course, this is Tom.